cardboard door out of the pass steps a beaming, moon-faced 23-year-old comedian named Oliver Norval Hardy. Oliver announces he's to be married in this comedy called Fatty's Fatal Fun, made two world wars ago in 1915, when life and the movies were both much simpler. Babe Hardy, as he was then known, made a striking figure in his striped pants and cutaway coat, and even a plausible, though plump, lover. But he was an obscure comedian in those days, one of the unknown hundreds who dashed madly about in the deluge of minor comedies that flooded the silent screen. Fame, stardom, and an immortal partnership with Stan Laurel lay some 12 long years and uncountable pratfalls, pins in the pants, and pies in the face ahead. Young Stan Laurel looked like this at the beginning of the decade which silent comedy at its height was to make the laughing 20s. Stan played a brash patent medicine salesman in Kill or Cure, one of his early Hal Roach comedies. Laurel's skill at pantomime was polished at the best of schools, Fred Carnot's English Music Hall Company, where he understudied the star, Charlie Chaplin. Behind that bushy mustache lurks Oliver Hardy. By the mid-twenties, Hardy had joined the Hal Roach organization, where he continued to play supporting roles despite a mad studio search for badly needed new comedy stars. Vivian Oakland begins to succumb to the musical charms of her new boarder, Milton the Mad Maestro. In this 1926 blend of slapstick and French bedroom farce, husband Glenn Tryon completes the triangle as Oliver fiddles while Vivian burns. Six months later, Laurel and Hardy were both to appear in a Hal Roach comedy called 45 Minutes from Hollywood, but never in the same scene together. Stan is almost unrecognizable behind that big black mustache as an innocent hotel guest harassed by a pair of battling intruders. Hardy, clad in a sheet, is the house detective struggling to break up the fight by breaking down the door. By the following year, 1927, Laurel and Hardy had been cast together several times and were beginning to pair up purely by accident. In films like Sugar Daddies can be seen the gradual evolution of one of the greatest of comedy teams. Before year's end, the names Laurel and Hardy blazed from the screen, co-stars at last in Putting Pants on Philip, the first film built to the talents of Stanley and Oliver. The plot was supremely simple. Uncle Ollie had just met nephew Stan at the boat. Stan is visiting from Scotland, and the attention attracted by his kilts mightily embarrasses Natty Hardy, one of the ten best-dressed men in Upper Sandusky. Walk behind me, says Oliver, far behind.
Uncle Ollie pleads with a rapidly growing crowd to disperse. With Hardy in the role of a sport, and Laurel as, of all unthinkable things, a lady chaser, putting pants on Philip differs from the later Laurel and Hardy films, for Stan and Oliver had yet to invent the bumbling, derby-hatted characters that were to make them world famous. Years later, when his career had ended, Stan Laurel was to name this his favorite comedy. <laughs> Hardy were old pros who, in hundreds of pictures, had thoroughly learned the exacting job of being silent screen comedians. Laurel was, in addition, a comedy innovator, and many of Stan and Oliver's best gags were to originate with him. They worked without pretension and for the moment, little dreaming that their comedy would continue to delight audiences more than 20 years after the cameras stopped grinding and the Klieg lights flickered out. Oliver dashes toward a building, which residents of the Los Angeles area have doubtless already recognized as the Culver City Hotel. Like so many other Hal Roach comedies, Philip was shot with an eye to economy just a block or two from the studio itself. What's all the excitement about, wonders Hardy. The director of this first Laurel and Hardy starring comedy was Clyde Bruckman, a master of the sight gag, who was also to direct Harold Lloyd. The cameraman was George Stevens, famous today as the producer-director of Shane, Giant, and the greatest story ever told. Uncle Lolly, let me show you how.
just an old Scottish custom, says Stanley. an old American custom, says Oliver. <laughs> a swank dinner party is afoot at the J. Medbury Frumps, a newly rich couple just learning to dog paddle in the social swim. At the door, the new butler and waiter, fresh from their triumphs as assistant deck swabs at Dugan's Bean Wagon. In the few months between putting pants on Philip and this comedy called From Soup to Nuts, Laurel and Hardy had found their derbies and the characters they were to play for the rest of their movie lives. fall down, admits Oliver. The harassed hostess is Anita Garvin, one of the Hal Roach Studios' harem of girls who could remain appealing through every slapstick indignity. <laughs> I fall down again, Oliver confesses. This tribute to the cake baker's art was directed by E. Livingston Kennedy, better known as comedian Edgar Kennedy, master of the slow burn. Played by Tiny Sanford, grabs for a towel. Only it's not a towel, it's Stanley's shirt.
In this moment of crisis, Stanley takes command. Here, double quick, says Anita. Did you gong, madame? asks the efficient Oliver. Anita orders, please have the salad served. Undressed. Fastidious Hardy dishes up the soup, while Greensman Laurel's in the kitchen preparing the salad. Chippendale, you made the chairs too high. order, Stan serves the salad undressed. Says Stanley to the host, they wanted it served undressed, and that's the way they're going to get it. In 1927, Jimmy Finlayson, Laurel and Hardy, and Charlie Chase, Hal Roach's top stars in their only appearance together, improvised comedy on the spot as carefree inmates of a happy asylum. In a mousetrap microphone, Charlie finds lunch. Stan and Oliver as William Tell and Target. This episode is that if you think you're a wheelbarrow, you're sure to get pushed around.
There's a home movie quality to these silent clowns cavorting on a long departed sunny afternoon on the Hal Roach lot. Meeting an ocean liner, impatient Charlie Chase spots his lady love, Viola Richard, on the upper deck. Viola goes to the left. Charlie follows, and fate's fickle finger flicks man-hating Anita Garvin smack into his path. Charlie Chase was the silent film's undisputed master of the comedy of embarrassment. He was also Hal Roach's most popular player until the skyrocketing success of his old friends Laurel and Hardy in the last years of the Laughing Twenties. says Charlie. I forgot something important. My hat. The impulse that cannot be denied. at last. A veteran of the Roach lot, Charlie directed comedies under his real name, Charles Parrott, and starred as Paul Parrott and Jimmy Jump, before becoming the dapper, impulsive Charlie Chase, a character perfectly suited to the jaunty jazz age. yard, Chicken King Schultz poses with his prize rooster, grand champion at the International Poultry Show. On the other side of the fence is Schultz's gardening neighbor, the beloved beset Max Davidson, who, like Charlie Chase, Laurel and Hardy, starred in his own series of comedies during the golden silent days at the Roach Studios. If any vegetables grow around here, They'll grow inside Schultz's seed gobbling chickens. Naturally, of all the chickens, Max grabs the champion. And naturally, just at that moment, the terrible-tempered Mr. Schultz is looking through the fence. Prosperity, flaming youth, and bathtub gin, screen comedy was a hallmark of the 1920s. In the picture parade that caused peals of laughter to ring out of every movie theater in the land, 
was Laurel and Hardy's Wrong Again, written and directed by Leo McCary, who later created such film classics as Going My Way. Stan and Oliver made the horses look smart. Masterminds over here, there's a big reward for the stolen blue boy. And there in the stable he is. Quiet now. Mustn't give the game away. They'll grab this reward all for themselves. Meanwhile, detectives Crovney and Freebs apprehend the crooks and recover blue boy. The painting blue boy, that is. Crovney phones the good news to millionaire owner Augustus Paddle. Don't fiddle faddle, orders Paddle. Bring that painting over at once. Stan and Oliver arrive with the equine blue boy. Paddle, who in the way of the eccentric rich, is taking his Saturday night bath on Monday afternoon, throws down the key. You mean in the house, asks Hardy. Expecting his painting, Paddle says yes, never dreaming that this blue boy has four hooves and a tail and may not be housebroken. calls from the balcony. Put Blue Boy on top of the piano, would you mind? Stan, who has been told millionaires are peculiar and think just the reverse from other people, wouldn't mind in the least. The Hal Roach studio where this comedy was made has been demolished, joining in limbo the Max Sennett studio torn down some years before. And so both of America's two greatest laugh factories have disappeared from the scene.
car arrives at the Paddle estate. In it are Paddle's dowager mother, detectives Crovney and Freebs, and the blue boy that doesn't whinny. Shh, cautions Oliver. Someone's coming. We'll give them a big surprise. Blue boy, thunders paddle, what did you bring? Uh, we made a slight mistake, laughs Oliver. cries Paddle, read about the murder in tomorrow's paper. No damage, ma'am, reassures Crovney. Detective Freebs is only stunned. Anders Randolph, a leading villain of silent days, took time off from supporting such glamorous stars as Greta Garbo to act as a foil for Charlie Chase. Charlie plays a type as common as bad dreams at tax time. The pest with the sneezes. Sight gag comedy, the great silent clowns, and fumeless, smooth riding trolley cars like the one shown here have all but disappeared. Progress doesn't always mean that things get better. Charlie is determined to save Anders' life if he has to kill him to do it. contractors arrived to finish a house. A New York Times editorial years later was to remember Skinny Stan, the foe, 
playing against Fat Oliver, the fiddle, and recall the gay, ingenious music they struck together. In the finishing touch, the fiddle and the bow achieved a symphony of sight gags within a total orchestra of just five people. The owner approaches the master builders and offers them a bonus if they finish on time. That we will, declares Oliver. Dorothy Coburn complains to cop Edgar Kennedy. You've got the authority. Make that track team over there cut out the noise. Listen, says Kennedy, if you must make noise, make it quietly. This is a hospital zone. Hardy orders, get them nails out of the way. in charge here, asks the nurse. Be quiet now or be quiet forever, threatens Dorothy. Thank <laughs> you. 
says Kennedy. The law can take no more, but gets it anyway. Thank you. 
of skill, sweat, and sheer chance, the house is finished on schedule. The proud and happy owner arrives to pay Stan and Oliver their promised bonus. The first bird of spring. Give me back my money, cries the owner. Unfortunately, the firm of Laurel and Hardy has a policy of no refunds. Finishing touch. Look who's moving into the house that Laurel and Hardy built. It's Max Davidson with his wife, Lillian Elliott, and his son, Speck O'Donnell. The neighbors gossip about the new owners of a home it took five days to build and five years to sell. Does this house have running water? It has leaping electricity.
special linoleum for people who change their minds. If you don't like the design, just mop it off. Mama calls to Max to help move the piano. In 1927, this comedy, Call of the Cuckoo, hit home to a lot of families whose jerry-built dream castles had turned to nightmares. It still hits home today. An approaching invasion of relatives. Is the floor crooked? Max brings in his spirit level. The only way to straighten that floor is to tilt the world. The house warmers, their goodwill is exceeded only by their hearty appetites. The arrival of relatives downstairs gives Max the urge to go for a bath upstairs. bursts the horde, shouting for directions to the dining room. coffee tastes different lately? Says guest to wife, with this stuff and a razor, I could shave. spirits live in a dull afternoon. Says Sophie to Samantha, if I weren't a lady, I'd belt you in the kisser. the telephone, cries Max, we'll be sued by AT&T. <laughs> the picture is called Liberty. 
and liberty is just what Stan and Oliver have foremost on their minds. Written and directed by Leo McCary, this comedy was released in 1929, when Laurel and Hardy had reached their peak, and both the laughing 20s and the golden age of silent comedy were drawing to a close. We brought your clothes from the old apartment, says Getaway Gus. Traveling trousers and Oliver's in a pinch. We'd better switch pants, says Hardy.
Get to the ladder, directs Hardy, who little realizes he's gotten back not only his own pants, but also an extremely lively future seafood dinner. This is no time for pinching, cries crabnipped Oliver. Producer Hal Roach was a past master at that delicious blend of comedy and terror to be derived from peril in high places. Hardy's idea of safety at last.
Why did you do that? asked Oliver. Oliver to Stanley, hang on to this and relax. classic comedy called Dumb Daddies, Max Davidson demonstrates the dangers of carrying a show window mannequin across town. The crowd wonders what murderous Max has in that sack and deduces it has got to be a body. Officer Kennedy asks Max if he saw a seedy guy with a sack. Is it yes or no, cries the exasperated Kennedy. to thin air. comes a gentleman who has been picking up too many glasses that were full and setting down too many glasses that are empty.
Your leg, madame. finale of Laurel and Hardy highlights believed by some critics to be among the screen's funniest moments. In Double Whoopi, the Prince of Pilsenstein, to whom Eric von Stroheim movies were mother's milk, brings old world glamour and bad credit to a New York hotel. Speech, speech. the prince. In my country, this would mean death. <laughs> In Leave Em Laughing, those madcap motorists, Stan and Oliver, overdosed with laughing gas at the dentist, explode with mirth at their homemade traffic jam. That arm of the law for every occasion, Officer Kennedy isn't amused. It's off to the station house, exclaims Kennedy. Hardy drive into a railroad tunnel, their worst possible avenue of escape from a band of pursuing Sunday drivers. Corpus, Oliver the Agile scales a wall. In the second hundred years, escaped convicts Stan and Ollie prove their painters by smearing everything in sight. The film, Your Darn Tootin, demonstrates Laurel and Hardy's peculiar talent for having their private fight embroil the whole town. Oh, <laughs> yeah. 
middle of the century transformed that old slapstick standby, the pie in the face, into Armageddon. down. The boys are bathrobed innocents drying off after getting wet, aiding two ladies in distress. Be bohemian, says Oliver. should enter but the lady's boyfriend, Vicious Vincent, alias Nasty Nate. Passing by, Laurel and Hardy's wives, human bloodhounds, master henpeckers, and crack shots. Into the distance and into memory, we will never see their like again. <laughs> 